G'day everyone, welcome to another Creation Talk podcast. This time we're talking about distant starlight, the, probably the most commonly asked questions that we get in uh, church uh, meetings and public meetings. I'm Dr. Jonathan Safadi, I'm with... I'm Dr. Robert Carter, and yes, this is definitely one of the most asked questions. So why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because the Bible specifically says the Earth is only a few thousand years old. And yet, according to what we know about the universe, it would take much more than 6,000 or so years for light to cross the universe. It's much larger than 6,000 light years in diameter. That seems to be a big issue. Um, but from my understanding is that the Big Bangers also have far too many light years per year. Yeah, this is something you explained to me years ago, something called the horizon problem. Explain to the audience what from, the horizon problem is. Yeah, I first learned about this from Dr. Jason Lyle. Uh, see, the horizon problem talks about how far some, how far you can see it. You, know, you can't see past the horizon because we are on a global Earth, as we've proved in a podcast some time ago. The point is, when the universe became transparent, uh, light could uh, that was supposed to be three hundred and something thousand years after the Big Bang, uh, light could start going through. But when you um, look at the temperature all the way around, everything is so uniform in temperature, about one part in 100,000 or so, because to get the same temperature, you have to go from energy from hot to cold. Yeah. And the fastest thing this can happen is the speed of light, and yet the universe is about 10 times too large uh, for the temperature to be equilibrated all across uh, the universe. You, you look uh, to... Um, your your north and you look to your your south or whatever there's supposed to be say 30 billion light years apart from each other they're the same temperature and yet the universe is supposed to be only 15 billion years old in the big bang model there's not enough time for light to have um, equilibrated the temperature so uniformly so in a big bang model there should be some lumpiness in the the early expanding universe that lumpiness is hot and cold and it since should those, be. you can't escape it. Since yeah. those, those places aren't causally connected to each other ever because they're actually span, expanding away from each other faster than the speed of light, you can't get the hot to go over to the cold and the cold to go over to the hot. Actually, that doesn't happen. You can't get the hot to spread out everywhere. Right, you can't help. It's a big bang under quantum theory. It's going to have very uneven temperatures to start with, but now we look at the universe as very even. The background is extremely even, and that, and there's not enough time to to get that equilibrium. That's a huge problem for the big bang. It's called the horizon problem. The evolutionary cosmologists say this is a huge headache for cosmology, and they've got a lot of weird and wonderful ways of trying to get around this problem. Yeah, they don't work very well. But what we can say is that naturalism just strictly using scientific laws, has problems even in the Big Bang model. And some secular cosmogonists, uh, those who study the birth of the universe, they are being very critical. Huge numbers signed a letter saying yeah. that the Big Bang is, is not good science. It requires lots of fudge factors to try to get it to conform to observation. All right, but I know there's other issues that Big Bang has with um, explaining things. Now, okay. this is the standard uh, Big Bang model, you know. I mean, the Big Bang model has inflation, which is how they try to solve the horizon problem is to have space-time itself expand much faster than the speed of light. I think you looked it up, uh, uh, yeah. increased by a factor of 10 to the power of 78, you, you found out. But people have a hard time grasping big numbers like that. Mm. Most people can understand a billion. A billion is a big number, but it's like the, the mm. limit to how big our brains will go. But 10 to the 78th is a billion times 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 a billion, almost times a billion. That number is magically large. They're saying that the whole universe just instantly just to some gigantic number. And the, the rate, it, it, it took one quintillionth of a femtosecond. Mm. That, that's unimaginably small. That rate is, is so fast. People don't even know what a femtosecond means. And a quintillionth of that, we cannot measure time that short. It's impossible. It's faster than the fastest molecular vibration. And so That's they're freaky. saying that the universe expanded by billions and billions and billions of fold in an unimaginably short amount of time. I don't call that science. I call that magic. Yeah, 
how we how how do you get to start? How do you get to stop? I and mean, how do you control how fast it yeah, goes? Yeah, exactly. Um, that's it's it, it, it's it's not you can't do that. Do it in the lab and show me it's real science. <laughs> of course they can't. Or give me a physical principle why you'd expect it to expand at that rate for that amount of time. It, there's nothing. nothing. In, there's nothing yeah. in physics that says this should happen. I mean, when I drop something, I know why it falls. We call that gravity. What scientific law controls the Big Bang? Nothing. And yet they might criticize uh, the creation, some of the creation models for saying that God stretched out the expanse, the rakia, on day two, probably continued doing that till day, on day four where the uh, luminaries were created. And we can say, well, God is outside of time. God created yeah. space. He created uh, time and therefore light. As speed is distance over time. So God's not limited by the speed of light. So we actually have a cause for yeah. super fast expansion. They have no cause. They've got magic only. Yeah, magic. In fact, if you look at the numbers, it's something like... Um, Something that's one nanometer in size, so you know, smaller than an atom, is going to expand to something more than 10 light years in size. Like that. So obviously this is expanding faster than the speed of light. Radically faster than the speed of light. And there's no physics for it. So we are perfectly comfortable, audience, in saying that the Big Bang model is not based on science. It's a way to explain data, but there's no physical backing to it. And uh, there are other people who think this is rubbish. Let's uh, assume and say that light itself was moving much faster, close to the Big Bang, like Joao Maguijo, Maguijo yeah. in, uh, from Portugal. Uh, he said that light was 60 orders of magnitude. Now, that means uh, 10 to the power of 60 times more than it is now. Now, some early creationist models presume that that we could solve the, the distant sight problem by having speed and light much faster in the past. Oh, these guys are heretics. Don't you know that light can't change? But now the secular Big Bang is proposing light much faster to rescue the Big Bang. We can't rescue Genesis this way, but we can rescue the Big Bang that way, and that's apparently okay. Now, to be fair, though, audience, mm -hmm. uh, most people yes. at CMI, in fact, I don't think anyone at CMI that I'm aware of, thinks that light speed was faster in the past. It's, we call that the Setterfield hypothesis now. Mm -hmm. If you look in Journal of Creation, some of the older articles on creation.com, you'll find a lot of discussion on this. In fact, it almost filled up several journals of creation issues back what, 20 years or so ago. Well, mm -hmm. even before my time, you know, that's how, how long it goes. Yeah, but most, most of us have not adopted that as a solution, but it is still mm. possible. We just, in physics, can't explain it. Well, it's a case of uh, we think it, it's not a heretical thing in principle. We just don't think it would work. We can make it work. That's yeah. the problem. We can never make it work. But there's at least, I don't know, four different creationist ideas to, to explain this mm -hmm. light speed paradox problem. Um, so we had Setterfield. And then after mm -hmm. him calls Rus comes Russell Humphreys with his uh, white hole cosmology, mm. which is really interesting. Oh, well, great. Yeah. The idea that if the entire universe was collapsed into a ball, you're in a giant black hole mm. where there's essentially no time. And if God starts expanding that material, when that material leaves the black hole, time speeds up radically, except inside the black hole. If the earth is inside this ball as it's shrinking because it's getting smaller mm. as things are leaving, then how do we say it? The universe could be billions of years old or billions of years could happen outside the earth. And then when the event horizon passes Earth, boom, now we see stars. Well, yes. I mean, when we ask about uh, how old is something, you've got to ask well, according to which clocks. I mean, yeah. the Bible is according to Earth clocks. It doesn't mean that galactic clocks might be ticking much faster uh, during this expansion during creation week. Yeah. And uh, Humphrey's model is perfectly in tune with uh, relativity. Uh, relativity yeah. is a friend to creation. It's not an enemy. That's right. And the um, uh, equations of relativity are, in theory, reversible. So if, if the equations for a black hole are valid, then so are the equations for a white hole. It's a case of whether we can get a white hole naturalistically. Yeah. That's the hard part. Well, you I think couldn't that. naturalistically, even though they do bleed energy right. because of quantum tunneling, but it would take mm -hmm. longer than the the age of any possible universe to get the stuff back outside the black hole again and you wouldn't have matter uh, just be energy outside it good old hawking radiation yeah huh? yeah um all right so that's that's two we got a possible the faster than the speed of light we have humphrey's white hole cosmology what's another one like other cmi speakers i usually offer a question and answer time after evening and public talks over decades we've found that the same basic questions keep arising 
The Creation Answers book is designed to answer about 60 of the commonest questions in 20 different chapters. It certainly makes my job easy when answering questions from the floor. For example, after many talks, people ask, what about stars millions of light years away? I can answer briefly, then say, for more, see Creation Answers book chapter five, which is sufficient for almost all inquirers. What about the date of creation? Well, see Creation Answers book chapter two. What about carbon dating? Well, that's in chapter four. Continental drift? Well, that's chapter 11. What about dinosaurs? Well, that's chapter 19, and chapter 13 explains how they could all fit on Noah's Ark. Over and over again, everyone sees that this book helps real people with real questions by giving real answers. Creation Answers Book is available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook formats right now at creation.com slash store. John Hart, who at one time supported Carmelian yeah. special relativity, and it's interesting because he used this, these these ideas to explain galactic rotation curve and expansion of uh, the of the universe without needing to resort to dark matter or dark energy. So it's a promising idea, but he doesn't seem to believe this anymore. But I think it still uh, has some promise. I think so too. But galactic rotation curves. You mean when we look at the speed that that stars are rotating around galaxies. You'd expect it to go down, but it doesn't. It there's the the stuff so on the outside is rotating too quickly compared to the stuff on the inside. Is that what we're getting at? That's the idea. And so they thought, well, let's have a halo of something called dark matter around these galaxies and the extra mass around the galaxies. Well, that, that explains why the, the stars are orbiting so so quickly. But no one can see dark matter. It's got what? What is it? Yeah, exactly. What, what are what are its properties? There's no, no spectral signal we can do. But then. Uh, a heart that showed that a Carmelian relativity would actually explain the observations without having to resort to um, a fudge factor like dark matter. Okay, real briefly, Carmelian relativity. We have Einsteinian relativity. We have special relativity, general relativity, and then Carmelian relativity. What is that? Oh, that has an extra velocity term. Uh, so it's a fifth dimensional calculation. It's quite an interesting thing. There are articles on our website about the Carmelian relativity, uh, which... Quite interesting to, to read, actually, just to see how he's published in secular journals about how this solves a lot of vexing problem. Um, and uh, Hartner knew him personally. Okay. I mean, and Carmelli's dead now, but uh, uh, Hartner, and he actually collaborated, it seems. Yeah, so it's a fascinating so stuff this out fifth there. fifth dimension, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's very mathematical, so that's daunting to mm -hmm. people. But we're trying to talk, you know, as little math as we can here, just to explain right. that, that we, have, we have some possible answers to these issues, and the Big Bangers don't have good answers either. All right, so number four would be Jason Lyle's uh, asynchronous time convention or the creation time coordinates of Tycho Tenev. What is that getting at? Because we, we have debated this long and hard in the office, and we've discussed this at length, and there's been hours of conversation. What do you mean asynchronous oh, it's really interesting, time? Yeah. Well, I mean, see, what uh, Dr. Lyle has pointed out quite correctly is that uh, we measure the speed of light in a two-way trip. We never measure a one-way trip. And in fact, there's no way to measure a one-way speed of light because here's the clock of where it starts, the clock of where it finishes. How do you synchronize those two clocks? You use a light pulse to synchronize them. So there's no way of actually doing a one-way trip. All the measurements are two-way trips. And in fact, recently we've seen some videos by secular people yes, basically have. saying the same sort of thing. Yeah, some of my favorite YouTube science uh, shows are have done a couple of these lately. It's like, yes, they're finally catching on. Well, audience, the idea is this. You can't measure how long it takes light to get from one place to another because you can't synchronize clocks in two different places. Even if you had two exactly identical clocks right next to each other and they're perfectly in time, and let's say you want to go out from the Earth to the moon. You take this other clock and you put it on the moon. You say, okay, how long does it take to get from the Earth to the moon? I'm going to start at exactly 12 o'clock here. And I know the clock on the moon's at 12 o'clock. No, it's not. Because you had to accelerate that clock to get it mm. to the moon. And that causes time dilation. So your clocks are already non-synchronous. There's no way in the physical universe to synchronize clocks in two different places. Which is why we always measure speed of light from where you start to where you come back again. You reflect it off a mirror or something like that. There's no physical way to calculate a one directional speed of light. Which does what, Jonathan? Yes, what yes. does that do for, the, for our understanding of the universe? 
I mean, we assume, and I, I think uh, assume quite reasonably, but speed of light is the same in both directions. That's right. the speed C. We assume that, um, and it seems to fulfill lots of physical uh, experiments. It's it's the most, uh, um, um, it's easy, the, 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 the least amount of external assumption is to assume that the speed of light is the same in all directions, but uh, you can't prove that. Okay. I mean, it could well be infinite in, in coming towards you and C over 2 going away from you. There's no scientific way to disprove that. And this is what these secular people have been coming up with. There's right. no scientific way to disprove what Dr. Lyle has, has said. I don't happen to think it's the right way, but it's not because I could, it could be disproven scientifically. Right. But, you know, new ideas are always interesting and exciting mm -hmm. to explore. So we've explored it. And um, one of the issues that pops up, not that I understand this extremely well, but one of the issues that pops up, if you start monkeying around with the speed of light, you also start changing time itself mm -hmm. and so what would you call the equivalence principle it doesn't matter where you are it looks like time is passing like normal but if right. you know for it's... us compared to alpha centauri or you know some distant galaxy things could be very different and we would not be able to tell from here it's also true mm -hmm. if things were different in mm -hmm. the past and maybe every maybe um during this expansion that God caused, we have all these time dilation effects, and then God stopped expanding, and now everything is like normal. We cannot tell. Now, one thing which does seem to, uh, uh, which the point in their favor is that things like there are some young age indicators in the in the universe. One is there are too few of the stage two supernova remnants, and basically almost non-existent stage three. So it's, the, the number of supernova remnants is far too small. Uh, for a billions of years old universe, yeah. but the numbers fit a biblically biblical age universe, and that would be uh, supportive of the Lyle and also the Tenev cosmology. Yeah. Oh, Tenev is similar to, to, to Lyle's in that it has um, the same sort of synchrony ideas. It's slightly different, subtle differences there. So, audience, I hope you're following this. What we're saying is that there's multiple mm. different models, and having multiple models is a good thing. However, some mm -hmm. of you are probably struggling with this whole idea of time dilation because it, mm -hmm. it challenges a lot of things. But we can measure time dilation and we can do it on Earth and we've done it many times. In fact, you probably have GPS on your phone. If we didn't account for time dilation, your GPS system would not work. In fact, it would have been failing the day after they set all the satellites in space. It would already, with just in a day or two, would be so inaccurate you wouldn't know where you are because of time dilation. Because yeah. those satellites the, the, are exactly those, those satellites are far enough above the Earth; they're outside of the gravity well of the Earth, and the clocks tick faster. And we can directly measure this. It's an mm. it's an issue of experimental science. We know this is true, and every time we've tested it, we come out with the same answer. Uh, yeah, relativity, make no mistake, is good science. It has nothing to do with moral relativism. Right? It's a totally different thing. In fact, Einstein wanted to call his theory the invariance theory because his postulate was invariant speed of light. Speed of light is the same regardless of, of the speed of the observer or the emitter. So invariance theory is what Einstein wanted, but it's now called the relativity theory. So don't be afraid of this term. And, it, and again, Einstein assumed that the speed of light was the same in all directions. And it's a fine assumption to make, and it fits with what we can see here on Earth. So it's not necessarily an incorrect assumption, but we have to understand it was an assumption. So um, what clocks do we use? When we look at Genesis and it says, you know, God created the universe in six days. When we add up all the, uh, the ages of all the patriarchs and combine all the time statements in Scripture and we come up with the answer that the universe is just a little over 6,000 years old, what are we talking about? What clock are we using for that? I mean, the only clock that's possible is Earth clock because we, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul said that all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching and instruction and righteousness. So if Scripture is designed for God to teach man, it means that we have to understand what God means, which means that God is going to use the clocks that we understand, which is the clocks on earth. Right. So clearly he's talking about earth clocks. In fact, the, our uh, six days of work week plus one day of rest is based on the creation week of six days of creation and one day of rest. Okay, So clearly God is talking about earth clocks. So when we're talking about the amount of time that's passed in some other place in the universe, 
it's 6,000 Earth years. I don't yes. know, necessarily. I don't necessarily know how many years if I were a spaceman and could fly to some other place in the universe instantaneously and sit there, mm. how many years would have passed? Because I can't get there. Physically, it's impossible. So honestly, the, the whole question is moot. It doesn't matter. Mm. Here we're on Earth. It's a point, you know. We yeah. know how old the Earth is according to how old God says it is. And we know that naturalism, as far as all the physics we currently understand, cannot explain the universe. But if God created the universe and then he lets go, now the universe today is operating according to the laws that we have discovered. I have no problem with that at all. No, creation is the ones who founded modern science. That's the topic of another podcast, how yeah, the biblical worldview of a creation that God has finished and now sustains in a regular, uh, orderly way. That was the foundation of modern science. Yes. Okay, Jonathan, tell the mm -hmm. audience what rakia means, this Hebrew word uh, that we hear so much. Oh, rakia is the Hebrew word that's translated expanse in the good modern translations. It's translated firmament in the King James, which goes back to the Vulgate, which goes back to the Septuagint ver uh, translation, uh, uh, stereoma. Uh, but it, all it means is expanse. The word rakia is, is connected to the word raka, which means to stretch out or expand. So the emphasis is on the expanding and the stretching and not on any material yeah, here. Substance, so, yeah. There's no substance in the case of just it's a stretching out that's that's emphasized in the choice of the word rakia. So, and it's also a synonym of the shamayim, which is the sky or the heavens. So he's talking about the sky here, the heavens. Okay. So this rakia that may have been stretched out, when we're calculating how long things have happened or how long that took, we use earth clocks. It yeah, only took six to days. Use. It doesn't matter how much time passed in the outer expanses of the universe necessarily. So what I like to say when people ask me, because I get to ask all the time, how old is the universe? I go through these mm -hmm. different models and I say, okay, in the end, how old the universe is, it might depend upon where you are in the universe. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't give billions of years for evolution to happen in other places. It doesn't allow for, for aliens to exist and things like that, because life mm -hmm. requires a creator. Life doesn't evolve all by itself. That's an, another wishful thinking area for the evolutionists. Oh, yeah. What it does is it allows our amazingly, tremendously uh, complicated and creative God to create a universe that defies the known laws of physics, which means it had to be manufactured by not using physics. It had to be created by a creator who's outside of time and space and has control over that time and space, and the universe mm -hmm. brings glory to God and God alone. And this sort of explains some of the puzzles that evolutionists have been finding recently. Like, you, you know, if you look further back, uh, back in, in uh, space, it's supposed to be also looking further back in time. So if you've got these things billions of light years or, uh, away, it should be very close to, uh, to the Big Bang itself. Yes. So we don't, wouldn't expect to find these very large scale structures like fully formed galaxies. This is a very big surprise to people finding fully formed galaxies that far away. They shouldn't have had time to form. And then you've got the metastructure. Um, the Francis filament, the Great Wall. These are these are, are structures of galaxies, yeah, chains so of galaxies that are linked together yeah. apparently with mm. gravity. And yet, mm -hmm. if you the further back into like, how old is the universe? They say thirteen point eight billion light years billion or something years, like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to ten billion light years, you've only had three billion years for things to form, and they can't explain it with gravity because gravity propagates apparently at the speed of light itself. It does, yep, that's the theory. Yep. And so you can't have a Great Wall or a Francis Filament or any number of other things in the universe, and you can't have fully mature, modern-looking galaxies at the edge of the Big Bang because there hasn't been enough time for gravity to create those structures. So again, another physical problem. So what we're talking about is the difference between historical science and operational science. We've written about this a, a lot on creation.com. We've been talking about this for years. It's the idea that you can use experiments today, operational science, to figure out all these different things. And we can take that stuff we learned to build spaceships and computers and cell phones. Mm -hmm. That science is not the same as going back in time to try to explain what happened in the past. That's historical science. And when we take historical science to its extreme at a Big Bang, we realize that it breaks down. So there's somewhere in here, there's a, there's a dividing line between historical science and operational science. We 
as a scientific advocacy organization, have no problem with operational science. Mm -hmm. What we have problems with is when scientists try to use that to extrapolate infinitely back into the past, which is what Charles Darwin did, which is what uh, cosmogenists do. They try to explain things using science or naturalism or, or physical law alone, and it doesn't work. Well, I'm hoping this is actually at least um, whet your appetite as you realize that creationists do have answers, evolutionists do have problems with this. And if you want to know more, uh, please look at the links and articles below uh, the, the video. Uh, do check us out also to, to share us on your social media platforms as well. Uh, so thanks very much for listening to us and we'll see you again next time. Peace.